Okay, well, good morning, everyone. If you don't want to become an azole, the best way to avoid that is to learn how to make them. And so I think today we're going to start um, some of the most uh, difficult uh, types of heterocycles uh, due to the fact that their reactivity can sometimes be difficult to control. Some of the reactions that you do on the six-membered series can't be done on the five. There's issues of regiochemistry that are often vexing to a medicinal chemist. And um, <clears throat> there are several classes, and they all have sort of different characteristics from the imidazole to the oxazole to the thiazole, all of which we will cover today. Uh, do suggest you take a look at the imidazole chapter of the book. It is quite useful. But today we are going to be covering this in uh, quite some gory detail. Uh, the easiest way to remember the nomenclature in this series is that as you remove the letters of the word azole, it starts becoming more and more unsaturated, going all the way down from azolidine to azoline to azole. <clears throat> there are your three heterocycles. You've got the midazole, oxazole, and thiazole. And the way of thinking about making these is usually through some sort of cyclodehydration. So Robinson Gabriel, for example, can be extremely useful when you're making uh, oxazoles. They also work for thiazoles. And of course, if you have a in situ formation of an imine here, those will cyclize to an imidazole. That's usually one of the most popular ways that these are made. Um, some of these types of things can be made in situ via the Hansch azole synthesis, wherein uh, the intermediate you see here is generated via the condensation of an amidine, <clears throat> thioamide, or an amide <clears throat> to an alpha halo ketone. You can also access another sneaky way we'll see today that can be somewhat useful in a variety of different contexts is getting your azole by way of a different oxidation state. So sometimes you will find it's easier to access the azoline or the azolidine and then simply oxidize afterwards. And then finally, a very, very useful way of making uh, all three classes, most notably the oxazole and imidazole, is by using isonitrile chemistry or the uh, Van Leusen type approach. Uh, one of the earliest ways that you'll see in the JMED chem literature of making imidazoles, uh, libraries thereof, is the uh, so-called Debus uh, imidazole synthesis, which involves the formation uh, of a diimine species which condense with an aldehyde. And here's an example from BMCL. And it's a really interesting uh, and nice three component approach, wherein all one needs to do is start off with your dicarbonyl plus aldehyde plus amine. and ammonia. And uh, those will condense together to give you out your imidazole. Now, obviously this approach is only gonna be really useful when you don't care about regiochemistry. <clears throat> if these two arrows are not differentiated sufficiently electronically, uh, and even when they are, sometimes you still get mixtures of products. So that can be sometimes a blessing if you're a medicinal chemist, maybe you want both and um, sign the regioisomers after you run the bioassay. So this can be a very useful way for combinatorial synthesis of uh, fully substituted imidazole cores. Another useful way uh, that came out for making libraries of imidazoles that really only works on, it's a very interesting reaction for the, the, this group at Merck, it only works on a solid phase. And um, <clears throat> the mechanism of this, I believe, is similar to one we talked about many lectures ago. And so perhaps someone can call out what goes on in problem of the day number one. And if not, I will call on someone. <clears throat> Looks like we have a, a lot of Pure Doge millionaires out there. Um, of almost 2,000 Pure Doge are circulating, circulating at the moment. <clears throat> so anyone want to volunteer or I'll just call on someone? I can hop in. All right, what do you say, Tim? What do I do? Um, so first, uh, this is like the, the Van Leusen um, type of rearrangement. So that amide bond uh, on the nitrogen lone pair is going to kick down um, into the uh, ketone there. 
and then that ketone will react with your um, tosylate. I mean tosylate. Uh, to so before you do that, before you do that, before we 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 so a couple of things we want to call this an amide. Try to avoid referring to a ketone, and Van Lucen will want to invoke that only when we have an isonitrile. That's that's so let's let's back up there. And then, then, yeah, and then the other thing we want to think about is when we expose this to EDC, uh, you've got to use the EDC at some point. So I like the arrow you started with. That's great. We're going to do that. But there's something else that happens first before we engage this electrophile. So tell me what that might be first, keeping in mind what you think EDC is going to do, especially because it loves a certain functional group found in this molecule. Yeah, yeah, I see it now. I, I you, you form the the Munchenone type thing. Okay, um, so let's let's get. How do I form the Munchenone from this? What do, what do I do here? So that amide attacks the carboxylic acid. Ah, okay. So I make my uh, it becomes a urea. Right. I make my activated ester. This amide then attacks in here, and uh, as you just pointed out, I'm going to make this kind of Munchenone intermediate. Why is it only solid phase? Uh, that's a good question. I think it might be because of a polymerization issue. Uh, at least that's what the authors uh, suspect. But yeah, I wouldn't have, ex you know, I've actually wanted to use this during consulting sessions in the past, read through the paper carefully before I suggested it, and to my dismay found that they pointed out it only works in solid phase. So this is not an approach, at least without some further optimization that needs to be done, not an approach to my knowledge that can be used for process scale. But yeah, that's a good question. I would love if the um, scope allowed it to be done uh, not on solid phase, but that is the at least very useful for medchem and combinatorial synthesis of uh, midazoles. So following this now, uh, I'm going to take advantage of that uh, imine that you were pointing to before, and uh, let's do our cycloaddition. What do you say? Sounds good to me. That leads us down a road. To an intermediate. Something like this. And uh, now what happens? You have a decarboxylation. Um, and anything followed, else? Followed by the tomerization to kick out the Tulsa group. Perfect. You get the product. Fantastic. I have a quick question. Sure. So, um, you mentioned that the, one of the, my, the potential problems is polymerization. Uh, you're referring to the mushroom itself, right? I mean, that's, that's the only thing I can think of for as to why this reaction doesn't work very well in solution phase. The, the, it's a JOC communication. The authors really don't, you know, um, tell us much details on, on why this is limited to solid phase. A question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so almost, uh, how common is solid phase synthesis is going on right now? It's a solution frequently or kind of thing in the past. Uh, how frequently is solid phase? So most companies have a... Um, a library department where they will do parallel synthesis. So for instance, if you've got a key scaffold where you want to diversify it with amide bonds or Suzuki couplings or whatever, that department might take over and then it's optional to them whether it makes sense to do it on a solid phase or not. But I can tell you that in my experience, um, in all of the years I've consulted, I have only seen people do solid phase in a medchem oriented group when they're making peptides. That's it. Um, otherwise, it could be a library department that decides to make various analogs and chooses to use a solid phase to do that. But, and there may be companies out there where they're making, you know, small molecule analogs using solid phase every day. So my apologies to them. But in my experience, I just have not seen it. It's usually relegated to those departments. So yeah, good question. Okay, let's move on to a uh, medchem versus process cage match. And this is a classic target. These types of aminazoles have found their way into a variety of different uh, uh, FDA approved medicines over the years. 
And so we need a first disconnection that becomes most simplifying. So Sung Han, is there, a, is there a simplification we can make almost immediately to this compound that's gonna get us back to something we can start thinking about uh, on how to make the imidazoles? Before we do that, is there a disconnection you can make for us? Uh, I think I will disconnect the alkene. Yeah, cool. awesome, brilliant. So let's just change this intermediate that we're gonna be focusing on for the next few minutes. Simplify it to that. Let's just think about that aldehyde. Because that aldehyde <clears throat> is gonna be the key intermediate for both the med camp and the process approach. So for <clears throat> now, now that we've disconnected that, what is the main strategic concern you will have as a medicinal chemist? Maybe we'll stick with Sung Han since you're in the medicinal chemistry team. So when well, you see that imidazole, what are you thinking about first? Uh, so I think I will consider to do the unalkylation. Uh -huh. That's key. We have yeah. two, two potential nitrogens, right? Yeah. Okay. That's, a, that's something you're gonna be thinking about the very first thing you, you think about. So can we, in a med chem setting, just take, let's say, um, this compound and get control over reduceselectivity of where we alkylate, do you think? Uh, I think in previous lecture, uh, we talked about if we install a halide on the, uh -huh. we, we can- Someone's listening. Yeah, we can okay. do the electron bias to differentiate to nitrogen. Brilliant. So <clears throat> if we try to do the uh, alkylation on that substrate, we are probably gonna get the wrong compound. However, if we install a chlorine here, everything changes. And now the major product of such an alkylation would be the desired one. We're just doing a simple benzylation as you can see here. Now this compound can derive itself, uh, of course, just from a simple two-step sequence of oxidation and NCS halogenation. And this compound can come back. Let's take, let's go look at our cheat sheet up here. How do we make this compound? Okay, we're probably gonna pick something like uh, maybe Hanch makes sense, something similar to this might be good. So let's go back here and think, okay, now what we need is a butyl, we need an amidine, and we need something that looks like that. And in practice, one can just use dihydroxyacetone. So I think they use that for self-tanning. A uh, very cheap compound, dihydroxyacetone, can be uh, coupled with this amidine. <clears throat> that will give you now the midazole, which can be oxidized with any of your favorite oxidants, followed by NCS to give you your chloro product. Now, the process chemists, of course, don't want to have that extra halogen in there because you've got to remove that halogen later on. For the medicinal chemist, this is ideal because we can make a thousand analogs alkylating all day to our heart's content. But the process chemists know precisely which one they need from the get-go because they have the final product. So for the process approach, maybe Simona can teach us what would be your first consideration as a process chemist in, in, in how one would put this together. And I don't know if Simona is here today with us today. How about Kelly? Sure. So <clears throat> you don't want to do that alkylation last. You want to bring it uh, in like maybe as the functionalized amidine. Oh. Uh, that's pretty awesome. So we're going to bring it in this way. Now we just have to figure out a way to couple it with an electrophile that gives us regio control. And the electrophile they choose is one that looks like this. And so in the event, uh, this one is going to uh, attack in a regioselective fashion, followed by tautomerization, SN2, and uh, loss of the bromide to give you the desired product. And um, you can imagine this one just comes again back from 
the nitrile. Kelly, is that what you're thinking? Yep. Sorry, yep. That's what they did, and it worked out well. Great. So sometimes this approach can be somewhat problematic, and it wasn't a problem for this uh, electrophile here. But when you try to do the same type of reaction with the electrophile shown here, something derails this process to an extent that makes it unacceptable for process chemistry. So who can help us out with this problem, or we will just call on someone? <clears throat> Perhaps Carter can just start us off with maybe just the first step, very similar to what we kind of just saw. Uh, I suppose you can do Michael addition, but I'm I'm wondering if you don't get selectivity between the two nitrogen nucleophiles. Well, let, let's imagine that we are continuing to get selectivity, and let's do the Michael addition that you suggest. Now, this has a couple of choices. We're going to do that um, tautomerization. OK, now what do you suspect this can do, Carter? Um, I suppose now that you have the cyano rather than the aldehyde, um, mm -hmm. yeah, keep going with that. I like it. I just keep just end the sentence. Could the cyano attack the, uh, or be attacked? Oh, I see by the, uh, Imine drawn there. Indeed, it could. And so we've got attack here or attack here. The major product results from attack B. The minor product, which is a problem on process scale, results from attack A. And that will give you. that, which we definitely don't want. And of course, the product that they did want and hope to be major was the one that is analogous to the thing we saw above. Fantastic. Questions? Sorry, I have a question about this. Sure. Um, so wouldn't the aldehyde be a more reactive electrophile? The great thing about it is it's reversible. So even okay. if it does attack, it, you can imagine there's some reversibility that will siphon you to the product, but it's a great question. Yeah, you, you'd expect, you know, this could be a problem as well, but luckily we have reversibility. And the one that's not reversible in the prior case is the product. So you can't reverse from there. Yeah, right. great, great question. Hey, Phil, I had also had a quick question about sure. the chem approach for the imidazole earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that if instead of that alcohol going to the aldehyde, if you just had a methyl there, would that be amenable to like benzylic oxidation or oh, that hit yeah. the nitrogen? Let's talk about other ways of making that aldehyde. I think that's a good idea. So what if, what if you had um, this compound? Could you oxidize there? The only issue would be oxidation here versus that other CH2. So we'll want to avoid benzylic oxidation. However, you bring up a really good point, which is we didn't fully analyze this compound in the way we should have. I mean, I would, you know, someone could have easily have suggested, hey, Phil, we remember this because you bludgeoned us over the head a hundred times in the first part of the course on that. Why can't you just take that and treat it with your favorite reagent, Bilsmeyer, and get out the product? And indeed you can. So I think it was Lanza and a patent many years ago. They also did that. So you can get that um, just from this simple, simple compound, as you can imagine, that's really easy to make from the amidine again, 
and an alpha halo acetate. So yeah, I'm glad you brought us back here, Tim, to talk about another way to make that compound. Questions? Okay, great. Well, the, the story with this continues. So here's Kozar. You may have even known some folks in your family that have taken this compound. It was a billion dollar drug at some point. And um, the way we can bring this back again is through alkylation. So all we need to do is get back to this compound. It's already got the chloro in there. That's great. And we just learned how we can take this compound and um, pretty simply uh, just bring it back to that. So a very fast way of making that compound. All right, great. So how about this, this uh, very, very useful, I've used this a few times over the years, very, very useful way of making imidazoles with a halogen at this position in a way that starts off very modularly. So you'll notice that this motif here is simply a Strecker adduct. So this motif can be brought back from OR, it doesn't need to be OR, an aldehyde with simple Strecker conditions, and then take the Strecker amine and then isolate it with anything you want. Very, very useful way of making imidazoles. And then that chlorine guess what you can do with that one? You can do Suzuki till you turn blue in the face. So you can make tons of different analogs with different R groups here, Suzuki to put whatever AR you want there, whatever cross coupling you like. And then also of course, whatever R group you want here. So a very, very useful approach to make uh, imidazole. So with that little sales pitch for why you should care about this reaction, let's talk about how it works. So who is willing to volunteer for this one before I call on someone? I think I can give it a shot. Let's hear it, Carter. So. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> My bad. Uh, the carbon tetrachloride and triphenylphosphine can react to give you the uh, dichloro triphenylphosphine and the uh, phosphine illid. something like that, the equivalent of that. Okay, great. And then what do I do with that uh, now nice phosphorus electrophile? Um, we can do kind of what Tim was talking about earlier, have the amide nitrogen lone pairs kick down and then uh, oxygen attack on phosphorus. All right. Now, what do I do? Um, I use the chloride around that can add into the uh, nitrile. And then? Oh, you muted yourself, sorry. My back. Sorry, I'm using. Do it again. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, have the nitrogen attack the phosphorus and lose triphenylphosphine oxide. So before we do that, let's actually draw that intermediate. And so from this compound, uh, we get the product. Now, this is a weird intermediate because you could imagine uh, instead of attacking at the phosphorus, which is what I showed here, we could imagine doing what Carter said, which is just attacking in here and losing triphenylphosphine oxide. But instead, what they actually notice on, um, they did NMR studies, and they actually show that this is an intermediate. But Carter's mechanism here is definitely more intuitive. I like I your mechanism better, Carter, but 
in actuality, they did the NMR studies and they show that they'll probably get a seven membered ring intermediate that looks like that. So very bizarre, but anyway, any the, the, the result is identical. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great, super job. All right, before we get to the uh, consulting corner, let's look at a couple more real world examples from literature. And we need a talented radio chemist. So perhaps uh, Tiffany or Camille, whoever's on the line, can help us with deciphering how to put a C14 label into this imidazole uh, fused heterocycle coupled to a pyrimidone. So we learned about pyrimidones on Wednesday. We're learning about imidazoles now. So we should be able to disconnect one of these rings pretty easily. Any takers? Perhaps uh, if Tiffany and Camille are not on, maybe we can go to Stone. Oh, Tiffany's on, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just not very sure. Um. So we learned about um, primidinones already. And the key of this problem is realizing that we need a cheap source of that carbon with the arrow. So if we make ring A and we make ring B, and then we think about disconnecting ring B first, I'm gonna ask you, Tiffany, what you think of this disconnection. And you tell me if intuitively you like it or not. Do you like that? Yeah, I think it looks fine. Well, now I have to know, and, and you know, the, the only issue with that is I've got to install that. So if I'm going to try to make this, I've got to make it from something that looks like that. We learned how to make things like this the other day. But how many steps do you want to do, Tiffany, with a radio label? Oh. Not, not that many. Yeah, I'm really worried about that because now I got to take this back to, I got to find a way to make this radio labeled. Right? Uh, and I don't like, I don't want to do that. That's a lot of steps. And I don't know exactly where my radio label is going to go. Is it going to go here or is it going to go there? Yikes. So I'm going to be doing long syntheses in an astronaut suit in a controlled environment, collecting all my waste for eight or nine steps. And um, there's probably going to be uproar with the amount of cost and time spent to make this compound. So let's go the opposite way. If we go the opposite way, it gets us back to a compound that looks like this. Now we know we can make an amide bond here. We know we can cyclize with CDI. All of that is very good. We still have one radial label here. We've got to figure out how to put that in in a simple and effective fashion. Is there a particular carbon atom that we have learned over and over and over again as a signaling element for a sneaky way to disconnect the heterocycle? Anyone? Cyanide. There we go, right there. Everybody identified it pretty much instantly. So if we then just, without any thought, just disconnect and turn it into a cyanide, watch what happens. The whole thing is unraveled. And look what you found. Look what you've discovered. You found cyanamide. It was hiding here the whole time. Where does the cyanamide come from? Well, if you make this compound, this is derived from glycine, obviously, commercial. This is your radio label. Your radio label is sitting right here. Just mix those two together, treat with base. And all you need now is radio labeled cyanamide. So there's your one carbon radio label starting material. Um, you form the imidinol ether and then dump in the glycine derived uh, uh, PMB amine. This can be done just by using trimethyl orthoformate. 
you don't have to isolate this. You get this compound and then you're basically almost done. How do you like that? Pretty intuitive. And you came up with it in one minute just by looking and saying, oh, where's the nitrile? And you found it. Once you did that, you found, oh, there's cyanamide. It's done, over. So it's kind of like a waterfall. Once you identify where it is, it just falls right down to the starting material. And the cyanamine, do you make that from cyanide and uh, chloro uh, amine? Uh, you can make it from cyanogen chloride. Um, and, you know, base, but basically, if you're dealing with one carbon, we can assume you're not going to have to make the radio label. You can buy that. So one carbon radio labels are going to be pretty inexpensive, all things considered. So you're not going to have to make radio labeled cyanamide. You can buy that. It's one carbon. Hey, Phil, tactically speaking, why did they condense um, and make, like, condense the aldehyde on instead of having, um, like, a, a type of, I don't know if it's a form of mine, but put the aldehyde on the nitrogen that already has the ester there? Um, well, if you do that, it's not a very good, um, you know, it's not a very stable uh, entity. I, so what you're saying is maybe try to take this amine, mix it with, uh, you know, make the N CHO here, PMB. That's yes. not really, that, that is a terrible electrophile. Instead, you're probably just gonna get deep protection when you mix it up with cyanamide. So this approach wouldn't, wouldn't work um, from a condensation standpoint. So that's why they chose that disconnection. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, how about this interesting little imidazole? We've got ring A, ring B here. Um, and if we disconnect ring B and we think about ways we might do that, it leads us down a road that looks, I don't know, something like X here, and maybe we hope and pray some metal can attack in there. But then we've got the problem of the regiochemistry of the alkylation. That kind of thing is going to be a problem because we've got competitive methylation here and here. So the A disconnect B approach is probably not great. Some of you might say, oh, why don't we do RCM and, and disconnect this? And you have a vinyl and an allyl. But again, that's just a, a miserable slog. So instead, if we disconnect uh, ring A, uh, Watch what happens. Van Lucen to the rescue. How do you like that? Can you think of a faster way to make that compound? No, I can't. Great. <clears throat> so Van Lucen can find its way into molecules in a very, very clever fashion. The key signaling element for thinking about should I use Van Leucen is looking for an unsubstituted C2 position of your midazole. If you have an unsubstituted C2 position of your midazole, think about Van Leucen right away. That can often be deeply enabling. All right, let's move on then to some real world consulting problems from the archive. These are, I don't know, many years old at this point. <clears throat> And um, so in thinking about how to put together this molecule, um, the first thing that stands out in my mind is the identity of this carbon-carbon bond with the ester attached to it. And in thinking about this, we think about the innate reactivity of a midazole being very likely to uh, be methylated at that C2 position. That gets us back down to a simplification, which now makes things a little bit easier, which is just this compound, which we know we can methylate and then quench it with something like a chloroformate, for example, should work just fine. And then with this compound in hand, we look at it and say, oh, check out that C2 position. And let's disconnect it because we've identified hiding in this molecule is Tosmic. I've used Van Leucen to save the, myself at least on multiple occasions.
Done. Look how easy that is. And this is very modular too. So the med, med chemist can find a bunch of benzylic amines. They can find a bunch of commercial aldehydes, dump and stir them together, and then add in tosmic to that. And they have their midazoles, which they can then attach their ester to at the C2 position. Now you so have- with the, the, oh yeah, Sorry, so with electrophiles, I was gonna say, it always goes for C2 first. Almost always, yes. Uh, there are some exceptions, and ob obviously this approach relies on the fact that these ARs are not interfering with the methylation. So that's key as well. I've blocked out that for IP reasons, but in those cases, those ARs were not going to pose a threat from a methylation standpoint. But yes, C2 will go first before um, the C5. Okay. Four. okay. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this one for... In this case, they wanted to put the AR1 at the very end. <clears throat> and we'd have a problem here. Uh, the problem being that um, if we try to put that AR at the end through some sort of <clears throat> Allman or Buckwald or Chan Lam, it's probably gonna go here, not there. <clears throat> so we can do two things. One, we can do um, Kelly's strategy. And uh, Kelly's strategy would basically be to say, well, we're going to take our AR1, we're going to attach it to the amidine. <clears throat> and then find a suitable electrophile to couple to could be something like that, for example. <clears throat> that will work. Another little tactic you should be aware of is that you can also take oxazoles. This is a known reaction. You can take oxazoles and with a amine and some heat, <clears throat> the AR that will add in and then reclose to give you your product. That could be very, very useful. Even more useful for the medicinal chemist that simply wants to make a library that literally at the very end you put an AR one. Whereas the strategy here that Kelly pointed us to earlier is more of a process like approach where you'd need to make an amidine every time you want to do the condensation. It's still short, but this one is way shorter if you can pull it off. Finally, let's take a look at this very strange one. <clears throat> this one is difficult because we've got this really hindered NC bond, which is gonna test the limits of all available arylation <clears throat> and arylation technology. Um, so any thoughts on how we might be able to put this together? Can you take that back to an aniline? If we just excise that, that's what you want to do, Kelly? You just want to excise it? Yeah. <clears throat> In order to do that, it would require that we make something like this. And I'm just going to abbreviate the morpholinoamide as E, if you don't mind. That would be the proper way to do it, right, Kelly? <clears throat> Love it. That's exactly what they did they found that they could make this compound, which is a functional equivalent of that. And this just comes back from, look how easy this is. Heat this up with DMF, DMA, and some pyrrolidine. The intermediate is the N, NN dimethyl, which is then displaced with pyrrolidine. <clears throat> they found it's a process team at Bristol Myers Squibb, led by Mike Schmidt and Martin Eastgate, found that the pyrrolidine is simply easier and, and better in the subsequent step. And that's exactly what they did. 
So this could be very, very useful for both med chem and process. Question from the outside. Yeah, how we approach. Um, how robust is the region selectivity with the uh, alpha and uh, and the amine? So uh, the, sele the select this is a, a question that we get often. Selectivities in alkylation with amidines, and as we'll see on Monday, with hydrazines. That's a big question. Like, how do you know which one is going to be uh, more nucleophilic? And in general, with the amidines, what we have seen in the literature is that largely the unsubstituted one will do the initial alkylation step. The more is more nucleophilic, and it starts the sequence. When we talk on Monday, you'll be even more confused by this one. That is, does that nitrogen attack or does that nitrogen attack? And we'll have a whole deep dive and rules to help you navigate that. But for the amidine series, remember that that is usually the one that's going to initiate <clears throat> attacks. And that's why it's going to attack at that chloro first. But that's a great question. Get that a lot. All right, super. So let's go on to now oxazoles. Well, now instead of imidazoles, let's talk about oxazoles. And one of the oldest ways of making an oxazole is the so-called Fisher approach, which involves taking a cyanohydrin and first mixing it with HCl and SOCl2, which does two things. First, the chloro, the chloride adds to the nitrile, the SOCl2, does that, and it gives us that intermediate. Now that intermediate can then react with the aldehyde. So you get addition and then subsequent cyclization on the alpha chloro, <clears throat> tautomerization, and out pops the oxazole. So let's take a look at some case studies of oxazole synthesis. The first one uh, being this interesting uh, compound from Albany Molecular. This is a process approach. And uh, in order to save time, I'm just going to abbreviate it by chopping off all of that and just getting us back to Now, uh, does anybody have a 10 second retrosynthesis of this compound? Can you use Tosmic? Brilliant. Done. Awesome. How about this VEGF inhibitor? This is a fun one because now we have an amino oxazole. Let me just tell you as a sidebar, when you see amino azoles run, and we have a lot of experience with them. Every time I get them in consulting sessions, they're, they're, they're really not fun to deal with um, because they don't like to do often the SNR reactions that you want them to do. If you've got amine positions in a, in a undesirable location, as we're going to see in just a few minutes in the consulting corner, the Buckwalds and the almonds don't work as well as you want them to work. And from a physical standpoint, they're often water soluble. So they're often a pain to work with and make which is exactly why we're going to look at them because we're focusing on the things that are hard. The easy ones uh, are covered in, um, very briefly. So let's take a look at a medchem versus process-like approach to make an amino oxazole like this. In the case of the medchemists, one way you could think of uh, disconnecting this, well, I'll, I'll open it up. Anybody have a quick idea of how you would uh, go about making it? Could you do something similar with the uh, nitrile and the C14 labeling thing we did earlier? Something similar to, so, you know, what would make my life easier is if you could give me uh, numbers for where you want to disconnect. So I don't ask yeah, that. Sure, sure. So um, disconnecting between one and five and two and three to form um, the nitrile and that carbon of the nitrile would be attached to the nitrogen on the aromatic ring. So if I'm hearing you right, 
you want that? Mm, not quite. So with the, the carbon-14 labeling one, how they made that um, the nitrile with the... That. Uh, no. Um, that would cyclize, uh, in theory, to give you a compound like And then you can imagine potentially doing aerolation. Okay, that's 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 what I was wondering if you could do something like that. Um, the only in you want to react that with what exactly? Because your nitrogen may be at the wrong position. Okay, I was thinking like an oxygen nucleophile could attack that. Um, oh, I see. Thing. So, okay. I like where you're going with that. So you would need to attack with this. And then the requirement would be that you somehow get this oxygen to attack here and that then to come down here. Is that right? I think it's the other nitrogen. Oh, you want this to make this to make the imine, and then that to go down and attack. Um, yeah, that is. These are. This is not really a matched pair. Um, now we need something a little simpler. I, I think this is a viable disconnection as a med chemist. Another viable disconnection that you might come up with would just be something like that and adding in the mean. And so we need a, a good way of uh, making that. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, but I do want to focus on for a second, this may be somewhat similar to what Tim suggested, the way that the medicinal chemists, one way that they approached this was just by taking an alpha azido ketone, treating that with a phosph phosphine to get the uh, imine, so the Staudinger intermediate, and then reacting that with AR prime isothiocyanate, which then cleanly delivers this compound. What is that? It's a carbodiamid. And then the carbodiamid, of course, can cyclize and give you your product. Now, med chemists can get away with the azide. Process chemists are gonna run for the hills, except in very special circumstances, away from the azide. So what they're going to usually want to do is the approach you see from this compound. So they're gonna go from A. Where does A come from? Well, A can come from a very simple disconnection. We can imagine that uh, if you take this alpha amino ketone, couple it with CS2, you'll get a nice reaction known as the cook. It's a cook type approach used for thiazoles usually, but can be used for uh, oxazoles as well. That gives you that. And this is now ready with PLCL3 uh, to be converted into the corresponding chloride. which they can then do SNAR on. So two nice approaches here for you. For the cases where you can imagine if the medicinal chemist came to you and said, hey, uh, my SNAR is not working. I can't do any buckwall heart wigs. None of it is working. The workaround approach is to bring it in via this easily formed isothiocyanate. And the Soudinger approach will get you to your analog that you need. Great. Well, we spent a good amount of time on that one, so we better move forward to this one, JTE522. <clears throat> this one uh, might be a simple disconnection for you to come up with quickly if you refer yourself back to the very first little starburst we talked about. And uh, it would be great if you could avoid the, the inclination to use Suzuki. 
If you do that and you avoid Suzuki, and we look at this as nothing more than arising from some sort of Robinson Gabriel, watch what happens. You get your product, <clears throat> easy. And there's tons of ways of making that. Let's take a look at this process cycling mimic and dive deep into it for a moment. And again, let's try to resist the urge to use Suzuki to do that coupling, which is anyway not gonna be really good. If you think about it, both the boronic acid here or here are probably not gonna be so stable. Cross coupling is often I would say most problematic historically in the Azole series. That's, I think, a truism. <clears throat> Often the cross couplings that you want to work that do not historically are in these kinds of Azole and Triazole type systems. They just don't behave nicely. And so we need to put this together in a way that would avoid doing that Suzuki transform. So is there a disconnection we can make? Maybe Noor, who has said something very, very sim similar to what we need to, to pull off here. Maybe she can help us with this one. We've got ring. Yes, for, what, say that again? Uh, for the airing, I was thinking you can use Tosmic. Aha. Uh -huh. Final substitute of Tosmic. Yes, so if we do that, take a look at what happens. It's just a Van Leusen. Now, they're going to use this isocyanide, <clears throat> isocyanide with base. They don't have the tosyl there. And so instead, when you don't have that tosyl available, what you can use is the acid in the presence of DPPA, which basically just makes the mixed and hydride. And if there's nothing around, azide adds in, but there's a nice nucleophile around. So that adds in instead. And the oxidation state you need for the Van Leusen is there because although you don't have tosyl here, this is not an aldehyde, it's an acid. So that's how you make that. And now we need to figure out a way to make that isocyanide. isocyanide. And that is put together simply from the corresponding protected amine. Now, where does that thing come from? Well, now we can do standard old <clears throat> Robinson Gabriel chemistry. This is again, glycine derived. <clears throat> Little ammonia, Robinson Gabriel takes place to give you your product. How do you like that? Super. All right, now this is a problem I get often where someone has a medicinal chemist has a carboxylic acid and they wanna explore a thousand different isosteres. Uh, or small heterocycles for that carboxylic acid. So they say, hey, uh, can you give me a bunch of roots to make a ton of them? Um, by the end of the class, you should be able to take that acid and convert it into at least a dozen different types of heterocycles. But for now, let's just talk about how we're gonna be able to convert that acid into the corresponding oxazole. Any ideas before I call on someone? How about Can Brendan? We, oh, sorry. no, go ahead. Sunghan, uh, Sung go ahead. I'm um, thinking about transforming an acid to an amide and doing maybe two, three plus two reactions. Well, uh, all we need to do is really just condense with the equivalent of this compound, which in general, people will just use this. So ethylene carbonate, and um, a little PPA will give you your desired product right away. So no need for the, the cycle addition there. So that's way number one, that's a great one. Any other thoughts? There's more. Brendan? 
I mean, I guess this is not very elegant, but you could just take that in on paper, you could take the acid and ethanolamine and cook it up with some oxidant, maybe. Yeah, that's known. That works. Okay. All right. Uh, another one that you might want to use, I would I thought you would have suggested based on your past uh, suggestions. It's that one. An amine we know we can get because we make them indoles that way, remember? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have one method, we have two methods, we have three methods. We have even another method that we can break out of our uh, box of tricks, which is the acyl triazole. When you heat these up, they lose nitrogen and um, you isomerize to give the product. So this plus heat will also give you the product. Light will, I think light works too. Great. All right, let's take a look at some of these case studies from literature on oxazoles. So this is one of my favorite of all time, this GSK paper in OPRD. And uh, we're gonna simplify this dramatically. First thing we're gonna do is remove all that spinach so we don't have to worry about that saturated heterocycle because we haven't learned how to make those yet. So we know we need that acid. All right, where does this thing come from? Well, I think it's probably gonna be rather straightforward to do a simple SN2 reaction. That's probably gonna react like gangbusters. So we're good on that. Now, how do we make that compound? Now, if we use Robinson logic, you can imagine that this, can you find, you know, is there, is there some sort of amino acid hiding in here, perhaps? If there is an amino acid, can someone call out what it is? Is it serine? Yes, brilliant. So all we need to do now is find a way to take that and somehow turn it into the desired oxazole. One could imagine that if you mix it with, let's say, that the product would be this, which um, you could, I suppose, try to oxidize to give your desired product. That's one way to go. But the stroke of brilliance here from the GSK chemist was the realization that instead of, and this is a trick you can carry with you to the process career that you might be embarking on one day, when you can buy your oxidation state in a cheap material, it's always strategically better to do that than to do it exogenously in a separate step. So it turns out that this is very easy to get just from dichloroacetonitrile. And if we put that other chloro in here, watch what happens. We just treat this compound with DBU. We've got this here, there, there, kicks out that chloro. And now we don't need to oxidize because this compound is in the exact oxidation state we need for after tautomerization to give the product. How do you like that? So that kind of redox massage of your starting material to product to avoid this annoying oxidation that on process scale is going to be extremely wasteful. Even if you could just do it with air, that's still a pain in the butt to do. But if you can buy it and just have a little bit of base, I summarize it. Wow. Now you're cooking. All right, great. Let's move on to uh, this interesting natural product for which we need a very quick disconnection of. 
So how would we disconnect this? Is there a strategic bond that we can disconnect in this natural product? Does anybody at least can tell us what amino acid it might come from? Tryptophan. Okay, let's take a look at tryptophan. Let's just put tryptophan there. We need to somehow find a way to convert this tryptophan And we'll just abbreviate that as R. There's our tryptophan derivative that Sunhan just told us. Now, how do we convert that thing into the final product? Formally, what do we need to do? Uh, maybe do an oxidation. Yes, that's all I want to hear. So our favorite oxidant for an indole, a really good one, is going to be DDQ. And that, as we learned before, um, this is going to be very, very happy to oblige in an oxidation by way of a hydride transfer. And um, of course, once you make this system, it's kind of ready to collapse. How do you like that? Okay, great. People often start with radio labeled amino acids for getting radio labeled carbons in these oxazoles. Uh, no, no, no. It depends on the size of the amino acid. Once you start, you know, um, it really, okay, the answer is it depends on the size. And, and um, you can buy radio labeled amino acids, of, uh, but if you're going beyond glycine, and you're, especially if you want an entio pure ones, those are very expensive. Um, so co cost prohibitive that largely uh, radiochemists will simply make the amino acid using Strecker with free, you know, much cheaper radio labeled cyanide. Uh, and then worry about enantiomers if they need to. And, and if they don't, then that's even better. But yeah, radio labeled amino acids, very, very pricey, sometimes cost prohibitive, even for large. Uh, so in the example above with the um, uh, serine. Could you displace the chloral first, and then and then that would give a different product? So, so what determines the selectivity there? Well, the selectivity arises from the fact that um, this is the most nucleophilic par partner, and this is the most electrophilic carbon. So you're just first going to uh, displace the iminoyl chloride to immediately get that initial adduct. OK, but then the, the hydroxy wouldn't attack the dichloral then the hydroxy wouldn't attack the dichloro. Um, no, after you do that, then the, you know, the rate of five member ring formation is extremely rapid. So the hydroxy adds into that same amino I see. system. Okay, so it would just kinetically be fast to one. No, the five, rate no? of five ring formation is super fast. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I meant the five member one would be kinetically the faster one. So that's the way it would work. Yes. Okay. okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, great. So some miscellaneous routes to oxazoles are shown here. These are some things you'll see in the literature. We won't belabor them for too long. They're not so often used. I'm going to show you some how some of these strange miscellaneous routes can be useful in just a moment in these little consulting corner here for oxazoles. Some blast from the past here of problems that um, I've encountered over the years with all the IP removed. Of course, in this first one, there isn't much IP to be had. When you see fluorinated oxazoles, these are usually a disaster. Um, they're hard to make. You can't use ring synthesis because the components you're using, obviously uh, those are not gonna work out very well. And amine connected directly to a fluoro in the case of that one. And uh, you know, imagine the acyl fluoride you might need for this one. It's all really weird. And so you've gotta have disconnections that kind of take advantage 
of a certain type of chemistry that we've talked about before. So what would that chemistry be? It's a clue for you would come from lecture three. Any ideas? We're not going to be able to add fluoride in very easily to a halide. We're not going to be able to use ring synthesis. <clears throat> so we only have one option left, folks. What if we turn the heterocycle into a nucleophile? That's what we do. So for this one, we just start with moxazole. That's cheap. And you can metallate. We talked about the Vetus modification where you add uh, <clears throat> borane here. You can metallate here, trap with formaldehyde, TBS protect. And then the next metallation step goes here <clears throat> and you can quench that with NFSI. <clears throat> if you want the opposite regiochemistry, given that the lithiation takes place adjacent to the oxygen in an oxazole first, all you have to do is use the TMS trick. So we're gonna put a TMS there follow the exa exact same sequence, and then chlorinate, uh, fluorinate, and then remove the TMS. Now, there's no literature on this, so I can't guarantee it would work, but this to me appeared to be the most logical way to go. Let's move on to this next one, which again is emblematic of the problems that people face in the real world of oxazole chemistry. They want to make this bond, and in this particular case, you've got two things confounding this step. The first thing confounding it is you've already have a bromide here, which is going to be far more reactive under buckwell hartwig type conditions or Omen, same story. And historically, halogenated oxazoles, if it's at the uh, four or five position, are really, really poor when it comes to cross-coupling chemistry with amines because it's already electron rich. Uh, those are rarely good reactions. So that's the problem we have. We have a double fold problem of the bromo and also a poor coupling partner. So that's a signaling element for having to do ring synthesis. And so if we do that, let's just put NR2 here, we find that there's a really interesting method that will allow you to do that, that basically couples these two species, one of which should be easy for you to see, and the other of which will be mind bending. <clears throat> so these Benz ox azolones, how are they made? Well, they come back pretty easily from the corresponding hydroxamic acid. You just treat this with CDI or whatever your favorite phosgene equivalent is. And now you have this nice, stable, crystalline, columnable heterocycle. And when these two are put together in the presence of an equivalent of triplic and hydride at 40 degrees, the first thing that happens is kind of understandable amide activation chemistry, wherein you get this kind of species. And then at that point, you can imagine there is a deprotonation event to give you something that looks like this. And then you can imagine this guy says, hey, wait a minute. I'm not very nucleophilic or basic for that matter, but this is a very potent electrophile. So I think I should couple to it. And that's gonna give you this species, which when formed will dutifully let go of its carbon dioxide cargo. And you can imagine that um, this adds in here to give you an intermediate that looks like which then cyclizes foes. Very bizarre reaction, but the scope of this one is really good. The coupling partner here is super easy to make and nice and stable. 
And now you have modular access to a series of compounds that would have been very difficult to make. This just comes from obviously just the acid. So the medicinal chemist only needs to take an additional step. And now they have access to compounds, which would be pretty difficult to make in any other way. Great. Let's move on then in the final 20 minutes. We only have 20 minutes to cover uh, thiazoles. So thiazoles, super important little heterocycles found in natural product chemistry. One of the most glorious examples of it, of course, is this amazingly big compound called thiostreptin, which was initially used in the veterinary uh, industry. Um, and uh, you can make, you can get kilograms of this stuff, but you can also make these compounds. So uh, we need some good ways of thinking about how to put together a compound like that. We look at this compound and we say, hmm, let me just take advantage of that. And then we need some sort of suitable electrophile to close that down. What could that electrophile be? Any suggestions? For a good electrophile there. Hint, we've seen something very close in the past. Could you use the glyoxal and then do uh, you do lithiation to add the ester? Well, you could you could break here, but I'm worried about all these functional groups, aren't you? Yeah. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to lithiate that compound. I'm scared. But I can make this compound really easily from the corresponding uh, either amide or nitrile. And all I need is a good electrophile. So really, what I'm looking for is something that has the oxidation state of that. And in this case, I need that there. So I need this. Oh, that's it. This is actually commercial and simple to make. You don't make it, you just buy it, but you could make it. So that's your electrophile. Done. How stable is that? Pretty stable. Out of curiosity. Oh yeah, they're stable. I've seen these used all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, they're toxic. Obviously they'll, they'll alk alkylate your DNA with reckless abandon, but they're, they're good, good electrophiles. Uh, and, you know, you'll just get attack here and uh, closure, and that's the end of it. Great. Well, a uh, similar story can be had here. All we need to do is make the corresponding thioamide yet again. And these thioamides, is the sulfur more nucleophilic than the... Yes, yes. Good question. So uh, this one, how would we put that together? Hmm. Well, if we break it up forward, this disconnection may not be as good as uh, perhaps if we looked at this as a molecule hiding of cysteine. So you could imagine that this simply a compound like that, not cysteine, sorry, but rather a compound like this, where in when you treat this with uh, to make the corresponding thioamide and triplicate hydride, that will then cyclize in a kind of Robinson Gabriel type cyclization. So um, let me re redraw this so it makes more sense. There we go. So when we treat this with a dehydrating agent, it could be Burgess, um, it could be tosyl chloride, tosyl anhydride, 
or even something like DAST. You can imagine there, cyclized there, and we've got the right oxidation state we need of the thiazolidine. And here's your serine hiding here, not cysteine. Okay, great. And here's a, another method for making thiazolidines through another dehydrating agent. I mentioned Burgess, tazolin hydride, DAST. And uh, here's another way of doing it. Triphenylphosphine oxide triplicate hydride from the Kelly group, which will take these kind of cysteine link structures and convert them very easily through activation in the way we saw before that Carter helped us out on that Merck problem where you get cyclization here and here to make these very cool bis-thiazolidines. All right, let's take a look at uh, these two examples, which are great examples from the thiazole literature. One of them is this interesting uh, triazine linked to a triazole, which is in turn linked to a sugar. So how are we going to go about putting this together? The first thing we need to think about is what bond or atom should we excise from this compound first? That's key. Well, when I look at this, I say, I'm going to get rid of that nitrogen. Right away, let's get rid of it. Once we get rid of it, we end up with something that looks like, looks like this. Diazotization of this compound will be like a von Richter type cinnolin synthesis, and you'll immediately get your extra nitrogen to cyclize in there. Okay, now where does that thing come from? Well, uh, we don't want to make this bond. That can be somewhat problematic with all those functional groups there. So instead, we should probably do it via ring synthesis. And uh, the way one can put this together through ring synthesis would just be by disconnecting and realizing that hey, wait a minute, there's my nitrile hiding. And um, so that could be... Uh, condensed together without any issue. Cyclization then gives you your, you see here, this fragment here is hiding right here. It'll take a minute to digest that. This sulfur has added in uh, into this uh, nitrile, which is right here. So, um, Outline it so you see it. So here is there. That highlighted is that. And it's easy to make a glycosyl cyanide. All right. Um, All right, Phil, can you just remind uh, me or us if other people aren't uh, aware of the, what's the conditions to go from the uh, first intermediate you, John? Okay, there you go. Just nitrosylation and then immediately immediate cyclization. All right, let's take a look at desatinib, a very um, interesting kinase inhibitor. And um, this was, I think, from BMS many years ago, very successful kinase inhibitor. And uh, we need to make this radio labeled uh, derivative of desatinib. So definitely gonna need some help on this one, how we put this together. Um, any thoughts on where this might come from? I need, of course, a one carbon surrogate. I need to do some disconnections that get us very rapidly to something of use. Um, the first thing you could probably notice here is that these two bonds can very rapidly be made. So let's just cut that out and make it a little bit simpler. We know at the end uh, we can do this without a problem. couple of SNAR reactions and we're good to go. And that leads us down the road to this amino thiazole. As I told you, those are usually some of the most difficult compounds to make. So there's our amino thiazole. 
we've got the label here and I need a one carbon way to install this. So um, does anybody see the building block that we can buy? That's one carbon that's gonna be logical to use here. Brilliant. And we already learned about this building block at the very beginning of class. Or this can be derived in C2 from the combination of those two. <clears throat> Fantastic. OK, so uh, off to the consulting corner, because we're running out of time. So we have nine minutes to cover these. Uh, uh, these two compounds, as well as the benzanulated series, which luckily is a little bit faster to cover. Um, in the case of this first one, what do we think about? Well, um, the first thing I think about is let's get rid of that halogen atom because we have innate reactivity on our side. So all we have to do is disconnect to that. We know with NBS, that is the selectivity we're going to get. And then where do we get this compound from? Well, we can sketch this out as probably arising again from the thioamide, which brings its way back to the nitrile. And all we need to do now to get the nitrile is find a good way of taking that ketone and turning it into the nitrile. And the way to do that is a reaction with a ketone and tosmic gives you the nice homologated nitrile usually use potassium tripitoxide, but like the Nugent homologation we learned about the other day, keep this in your back pocket. It's a very useful way of taking ketones and turning them into the corresponding nitrile. Of course, you could also just look in the commercial supply catalog and find that you can buy that. So you could take that and convert it to the nitrile, or you could take the ketone and convert it to the nitrile. Let's move to this next one, because we're running out of time. And we've got A and B ring systems. Now, when I looked at this, the best way to do it is just to think about the two possible ring systems. So if we're going to disconnect B, what ends up being the uh, disconnection is something that looks like that. Uh, and that one suffers from the fact that I don't know how to make that bond versus that bond. So that's not going to be very select, not going to be very selective or very strategic. It's not a disconnection you want to give to anybody. Whereas if we disconnect the thiazole, look what happens it becomes rather intuitive. Right? This is just a formic acid oxidation state here. Right? So we can just cyclize that close, no problem. Where does this thing come from, back from? Well, this is nothing more than a Strecker adduct. Look at that. And where does that come from? Well, this is simple. Available, makeable, but also commercial. Done. Easy. Let's quickly take a look at the benzanulated systems. The benzanulated systems, this works with, uh, these are your go-to ways of making the amino and uh, unsub substituted, unsubstituted benz, ice ox benz oxazoles, benz thiazoles, benzimidazoles, cyanogen bromide, or equivalents thereof will give you very rapid access to that, depending on your X group, CS2 in base, same story. We'll give you that, which you can then methylate, turn into a nice leaving group, POCl3. We'll give you also the chloro there. Treating with acid and heat, not surprisingly, will very quickly give you a cyclocondensation to give you that. Uh, isothiocyanate, same story. And one of the most often ways of doing this is through intramolecular cyclizations, which you can use isocyanates, isothiocyanates, um, or carbodiamides to give you that series, where X is whatever you want there. Usually using copper is usually the one I suggest, but palladium will also work in certain cases. 
All right. Well, uh, for time of lim limitation time, we're going to have to skip problem of the day number five because I believe it is covered already in the 2019 lecture. So we're just going to skip right through that. And we're going to switch right down to this one. And just a reminder that these diamino systems can be easily accessed from the corresponding nitro uh, uh, aniline. And those are, of course, available from that. We've seen this already in a prior lecture. And this is sodium dithionate is an alternative way to reduce nitro, but you can reduce those nitros with iron filings, palladium on carbon. There's a hundred ways of doing it. So the final five minutes, we are at the final five minutes. And in those final five minutes, we will cover the last two consulting problems from the real world that then this time pertain to the benzimidazole and benzothiazole. So these folks in this first problem wanted a way to do late stage R incorporation. So from the methods I have shown above, what would you recommend for doing a late stage nitrogen incorporation? First question I would wanna ask you is, uh, maybe just cold call someone, we're running out of time. Um, is Ellie here? Uh, how about um, um, Daniel? Daniel, um, can I just do a uh, Ullman or a Buckwall from the corresponding benzimidazole to make this compound? Hmm. Can you recommend that to the medicinal chemist when they're asking you if that, that would be a good idea in the interview? Uh, no, I don't think you'd get Why not? Why not? selectivity. Aha, uh -huh. so this is a bad idea. No selectivity. So uh, what way would let me get modular access to this compound from the methods we have seen above? Um, Not too sure. Well, if I need to install this at a late stage, why don't you just remove it? That's how you buy yourself time on the interview because they're gonna give you questions that you don't know. And so let's just remove it. They say, oh, they want a modular way. And then you start drawing. And as you draw, you pray, will this answer come to me? Please, please, I want this job. And you draw the amine here. And at this point you say, well, I need to, you're going to install it late stage. Uh, Daniel, has it come to you? So maybe you could have a halogen. Okay, you did it. So if you don't know, it's fine. Just start drawing. Because you know you can't make it through the Buckwall reaction because of selectivity issues. So you just draw the open form, buy yourself time. And then by the time you're done drawing this, the X just comes to you because there's nothing else left. So yes, this would just work with an Ullman approach. You're done. Great, let's take a look at this approach to make a thiazole. And you'll notice we're in the same, uh, potentially same situation. So how are we going to break this up? Well, uh, we've got a tetrasubstituted aromatic. And so if we take this back, we can imagine that we can potentially simplify our life by again doing the same type of cyclization. Where does this thing come from? Well, it looks to me like that would be a great directing group for a directive methylation, perhaps. And, uh, only a little mistake there is I missed my sulfur. There we go. And so a directive methylation would give us our bromine and then uh, copper iodide, whatever your favorite almond conditions are would give you a product and you would then go back to SciFinder and realize, oh, this is very, very cheap. So I'm good to go. I've got double direction here in the direct methylation, So that part should be fine to propose. And then the cyclization with copper iodide is very well precedented. So that's it. We made it uh, on time, folks. That is the lecture on 1,3 azoles, but it gets more complicated than this far more complicated. So um, next week, we're gonna start talking about one, two azoles and their derivatives thereof. 
Um, and so the complexity level next week will definitely ramp up even more, uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you have time this weekend, go back and review some of the notes and the lectures we've talked about already. So you're well prepared for Monday. Uh, everyone have a great weekend and uh, yeah, we'll see you on Monday.